and welcome to this webinar on challenges and opportunities in Indian agriculture. My name is Anu Ramohan and I'm a professor of economics and the academic lead for the Australia India Institute at UWA. I want to begin by acknowledging that the University of Western Australia is situated on Noongar land and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Today we are privileged to have a panel of three eminent agricultural scientists to present their research on the challenges and opportunities on in, uh, for Indian agriculture. They include Professor Rajiv Vashni from ICRISAT, Dr. Singh, and Hackett Professor Kadambot Siddiq. I would like to begin by inviting Ms. Tantu Charandasi, the Consul General of India, based in Perth, to say a few words. Ms. Charandasi is an Indian Foreign Service of Officer, and before moving to Western Australia, she served in the Latin America, Caribbean, and multilateral economic divisions of the Ministry of External Affairs. Um, Ms. Charandasi is an important supporter of strengthening research cooperation between Western Australian universities and India. Um, I'd like to welcome you, Madam, to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Anu Ramohan, those, for those kind words. And uh, of course, welcome to Dr. Ashok Singh and uh, uh, Professor Rajiv Vashni from India and uh, Professor Kadambod Siddiq. Uh, it's so nice to uh, see all of you after I think a long time uh, since we had last met. And uh, uh, a very good afternoon and namaste to all the distinguished participants. Let me congratulate the Australia India Institute for organizing the India Week for the first time here. And I appreciate this collaborative webinar by the University of Western Australia and the initiative of Professor Kadambod Siddiq on this very important topic of agriculture, which is of mutual interest and plays a very crucial role in India-Australia relations. Agriculture is the primary source of livelihood for about 58% of India's population. And the gross value added by agriculture, forestry, and fishing estimated at uh, US dollar 276.37 billion in the current financial year. India is the largest producer of spices, pulses, milk, tea, cashew, and jute, and the second largest producer of wheat, rice, fruits, and vegetables, sugar cane, cotton, and oil seeds. The Indian food and grocery market is the world's sixth largest market. India is second in the global production of fruits and vegetables. The Indian food industry is poised for huge growth and offers immense opportunities, particularly in food processing industry. India is among the 15 leading exporters of agricultural products in the world. Keeping with Prime Minister Modi's vision to transform the farm sector and eight farm reforms, eight point farm reforms in the agriculture sector have been brought out with a tranche of rupees 20,000 crores Atmanirbhar Bharat special economic package to combat the crisis triggered by coronavirus pandemic, which includes Agri Infrastructural Fund for creating farm gate infrastructure for farmers, including cold chain and post harvest management structure in the vicinity of the farm gate. Scheme for formalization of micro food enterprises, which promotes vocal for local with global outreach vision outlined by Prime Minister Narendra Modi with self reliance as the mantra. Pradhan Mantri Matsya Sampada Yojana for fishermen national animal disease control program, animal husbandry infrastructure development fund for supporting private investments in dairy processing and value addition and cattle feed infrastructure promotion of herbal cultivation, beekeeping initiatives in the rural area and operation green to prevent the wastage of agricultural produce due to disruption of supply chains during the lockdown. Keeping in view the present challenges of an Indian farmer with insufficient resource infrastructure and technology for growing crops, Prime Minister Modi has brought in brainstorming innovative ideas backed with sufficient funding. Make in India for agricultural equipments, per drop per more crop and per land more crop, and to double the farmer's income in the coming years has been one of the thought process of the government. 
several projects under Atal Innovation and also direct funding for the farmers and to NGOs and universities have been given to promote these ideas. With completing research and doing research at laboratory scale as one aspect and realizing it in reality being another major aspect, scientists have been asked to adopt five villages so that the knowledge-based farmers get improved techniques and they're able to implement the latest available technologies in the right way of cultivation. So whatever research and new technologies by way of using sensors, drones, in you know, artificial intelligence, satellite imagery that is being generated within India and globally should reach the farmer so as to benefit the agricultural field and also increase the profitability of the farmers. I'm confident this type of webinars will form part in realizing these goals and reaching out to the farmers in line with the government initiatives. The recent Farmers' Bills 2020 introduced by the government is the potential game changer for Indian agriculture sector and is expected to usher in a progressive change in the arena of Indian agriculture and in doubling farmers' income. During the Virtual Leaders' Summit in early June this year, a grain partnership was endorsed under the comprehensive strategic partnership between India and Australia. The partnership will bring together decision makers from government and industry and foster connection and collaboration among Indian and Australian grain growers, storage and logistical experts. Australia is a natural partner for India for collaboration on grains management. Further collaboration opportunities also exist between India and Australia in the areas of technology transfer, agri-research, agri-tech startups, post-harvest management, grain storage, etc. We look forward to positive engagements and increased collaborations between India and Australia in the area of agriculture. Wish you all a very happy Deepavali. Thank you and wishing you the best for the seminar. Namaskar. Thank you, Madam, for those um, interesting, um, develop, telling us about the interesting developments in India. I would now like to begin by in, in my inviting Dr. Ashok Singh. Um, Dr. Ashok Singh will talk to us about the challenges and opportunities for Indian agriculture. Um, Dr. Singh is the director of India's premier agriculture research institute, the Indian Agriculture Research Institute based in New Delhi. And Dr. Singh is a molecular rice breeder and has developed more than a dozen basmati rice varieties combining resistance to biotic stresses, such as bacterial blight and blast. He is a very well-renowned professor and he has published more than 100 research papers and supervised more than 20 students. Dr. Singh, please um, tell us about it. Thank you, Professor Anu. And uh, I would also like to express my gratitude to Rajiv and Professor Siddiq for connecting me to uh, this great gathering and uh, inviting me for this uh, webinar. Uh, we had a uh, you know, brief uh, by the Consul General India on the uh, scenario of Indian agriculture and what government is uh, currently planning. Uh, I will be uh, talking on some of those issues, uh, although Rajiv said that my specialization is rice and uh, the, the, the topic assigned to me was uh, challenges and opportunities for Indian agriculture. So I made it a little more broad based, but I will come to rice uh, uh, briefly. And with that, I would like to share my screen. Uh, so if we look at the challenges and opportunities for Indian agriculture, uh, if you look at the Indian National Agriculture Research System, uh, it's a, a very robust system globally. Uh, one of the strongest uh, national agriculture research system, which has got, uh, you know, 104 uh, commodity-based institutions, 72 state agriculture universities, and three central agriculture universities, which are uh, uh, responsible for agriculture research education and extension in the country. And uh, this has led to uh, the green, white, and blue revolution. And uh, as uh, was narrated, there has been six-fold increase in food grain production from 50 million tons in 1950 
to current level of 295.67 million tons. Horticulture productions have gone up to 320 million tons. And uh, the reduction in property from 70% to 20% maintaining buffer stock, more than 50 million tons. In fact, this time when we entered the lockdown on 22nd March 2020, India had 70 million tons of buffer stock. And with that government promised uh, 80 uh, million people, 800 million people to provide free rats until uh, November. And that scheme is uh, continuing. And this is all because of the strong agriculture base. The milk production from 20 million ton to 184 million tons, fish production from less than 1 million ton to 12.6 million tons, and uh, a, a gross uh, export of more than 20 million tons of uh, food grains, which amounts to about 39 billion US dollar at the current uh, export. However, the impact of uh, green revolution in terms of, you know, uh, the uh, effect on soil, environment, and several other factors uh, are seen in terms of factor productivity decline, decline in soil health and water table, nutrient imbalance and huge efficiency, increased incidence of diseases and pests, dependence on costly inputs, non-availability of labor, and uh, the farm mechanization, reduced farm profitability. So these are some of the, you know, the consequences that uh, have happened. So in spite of the green uh, revolution in food and production, white revolution, what we refer to as milk production and blue revolution as fish production, uh, there is a need to uh, have uh, reform in agriculture. And these reforms are needed because uh, there is a sustainable development goal related challenges before us, which includes uh, addressing the problem of poverty, hunger, malnutrition, climate change, and on top of that, the COVID-19 situation, which has really put us on toes. And uh, also the farmers related uh, issues, uh, that is uh, low income, attracting youth in agriculture has become a major uh, challenge. Uh, nobody wants to take up agriculture as a profession and then major policy uh, reforms. So uh, then uh, if we see the, uh, how this reform uh, should happen and must secure and sustainable agriculture by the way of uh, agricultural diversification, secondary agriculture, speciality agriculture from production to post-production value chain. This is extremely important because India is currently looting about 35 to 40 percent of its total production in uh, food grains and also in the particularly in case of uh, perishable uh, fruits and vegetables uh, because of the poor post-harvest management, consolidating the gains that have been achieved. These are the major uh, issues and uh, you see this uh, screen is uh, stacking. Okay. All right, that's fine. So uh, uh, considering these factors, the uh, a high level committee was constituted uh, with uh, 150 scientists and the stakeholders and uh, uh, 12 expert members. And the committee has submitted a report on policies and action plan for secure and sustainable agriculture in August 2019. Some of the recommendations I would like to touch upon, and these are uh, particularly uh, harnessing science for new gains. And this is going to be the major focus, whether it is GM crops, genome editing, using CRISPR-Cas9, ICT, big data, bioinformatics, and then uh, uh, the precision agriculture using drones, robotics, artificial intelligence, farm mechanization, and eco-regional planning. Because India is a country with huge diversity. If you talk of rice, rice is grown uh, from below two meter sea level to 2000 meter above mean sea level in India. That's the kind of diversity from Kerala to uh, you know, uh, Jammu and Kashmir. So eco-regional planning is very, very important for agriculture to be profitable. And this uh, uh, also needs incentive for innovation and at least 1% uh, of the agricultural GDP should be invested in agriculture research and development. This is extremely important. Uh, our current investments are not very uh, high. What are uh, essentially required to be done? Uh, the hybrid technology, upscaling, biotechnology, uh, particularly uh, uh, genetic modified, genetically modified crops, you know, meditings. Sustaining agriculture production system and conserving natural resources. And that's, that's where the area under conservation agriculture or plan is to take it from 3.5 million hectare currently to 20 million hectare because conservation agriculture is the future of agriculture in terms of conserving natural resources and addressing the problem of greenhouse gas emission and so on. 
protected cultivation currently our area is just 50000 hectare and this should be taken to at least 0.5 million hectares uh, in coming few years micro irrigation schemes must be increased from uh, 6 to at least 10 million hectares bioenergy biofuel and that's where sugarcane uh, maize and huge applied extra this has been a major concern in india uh, you know particularly in the states of punjab haryana and western up where rice is grown in roughly say 7 to 8 million uh, hectare area and on average with 5 tons you produce about 40 million tons of biomass and this biomass uh, generally is uh, put to fire and that uh, leads to a lot of environmental issues the pollutions during the month of november now is going to come so uh, how this uh, paddy is struck can be managed by in situ management strategies and ex situ management strategies combined together uh, so that this problem is addressed and also the soil fertility is improved elevating hidden hunger a lot of work has been done on biofortified crops and more than 72 crop varieties uh, of different crops rice wheat maize corn millet have been developed which are biofortified uh, with either pro vitamin a iron zinc Uh, high uh, calcium protein and uh, reduced anti nutritional factors like uh, phytic acid and so on so upscaling these varieties productions and bringing them in the food chain system is important to address the problem of hidden hunger reduction of post harvest losses as i said this is again a very very important problem and uh, the investment in this area has been uh, slow if you see of the total research uh, the investment in agriculture for a, a gain of uh, say 2% of productivity uh, bulk of investment gain to enhancing the productivity but almost 35 to 40% is lost because of poor post harvest management and therefore the investment in this sector has to be very very high and so far this investment has been very very low uh, ICT for knowledge sharing using each of all social media farm science centers india is unique to have uh, what we call as krishi vigyan kendra they are called farm science center and one KBK our farm science center is located in each of the districts so the total number is 715 each districts one farm science center and they serve as the purpose of front line demonstration of cutting edge uh, technology which are developed by any institutions in the country to reach the farmers at their earliest improving terms of trade for agriculture and there that means the higher farm gate price and in this context the government has come out with several reforms i will discuss briefly retaining youth in agriculture making them from job seeker to job provider this is another major challenge which the country is going to address with the entrepreneurship development program now considering this the the government had uh, uh, started from 2nd october and going to conclude on 30th uh, october this one month long program what is called vaivho vaivho means uh, vaishvik bharti uh, uh, vigyanik uh, sammelan that means the indian diaspora working uh, in other countries uh, with one month long deliberations against uh, 17 verticals and of that one vertical identified was uh, agricultural economics and food security and this vertical uh, uh, the indian council of agriculture research has uh, uh, participated in big way iri has been participating in number of such events and uh, one of the horizontals in this vertical uh, was uh, climate smart and precision agriculture and in this we had uh, sessions on sensor and sensing for precision agriculture climate change adaptation and mitigation technologies resource conservation technologies microbial resources for sustainable agriculture and uh, uh, to your surprise you know and our surprise as well the sensor and sensing precision agriculture we had 1019 online participants in this entire session it was so well attended and uh, we had six universities they participated and we have uh, Uh, quite a few participants from australia we are trying to develop these programs and programs will be developed in the area of sensor based monitoring of soil health digital soil mapping modern analytics driven precision nutrient management solution sensor and artificial intelligence uh, driven high throughput plant phenotyping development of integrated assessment and precision support system for real time uh, serving to farmers and other stakeholders development of multiple stress tolerant varieties of rice wheat maize etc low carbon technologies for input efficiency mapping soil microbiome and indian agri ecosystem and for each of these subject areas we have identified the partners uh, from the uh, indian diaspora uh, and uh, these uh, programs are going to be strengthened uh, for the collaboration uh, purpose <coughs> now 
Uh, in terms of policy reforms, the government has come out with the three uh, important farm bills, and these are APMC reforms, which is called Agricultural Produce Marketing Committee reforms, where earlier farmers were allowed to sell their produce in the uh, uh, designated way in Monday, but uh, the liberalization allows them to sell the produce outside the uh, Monday, and therefore, this would allow a lot of investment from the private sector in terms of developing uh, infrastructure for the storage and preventing private uh, the, the post-harvest uh, losses. The contract farming is another area where uh, maximum emphasis has been given. So this is again going to help aggregation uh, and uh, production of uh, similar quality of uh, agri-produce with the help of uh, uh, you know uh, the people who are interested in producing a particular commodity in large quantity, uh, tying up with the industry, with the export houses. And then the third uh, major reform is Essential Commodity Act 1955. So earlier, some of the uh, food grains, particularly you know the rice, wheat, uh, onion, potato, uh, uh, these commodities they were uh, uh, designated as essential commodity. And for that, any storage beyond certain limit was not allowed. The holding was not allowed. Now these have been brought out of this unless there is a uh, situation of war or uh, urgency. The uh, storage uh, is permitted, and this will again help the private sector developing infrastructure uh, on the farm gate for storage. And therefore, these 35 to 40 percent losses that can be prevented, and that will directly enhance the value of the uh, farmers. And therefore, uh, taking all this into account, the target by you know 2025 is to uh, uh, to develop India as a five trillion economy, and of that, 20 uh, percent, almost one trillion contribution has to come from agriculture. The agricultural export is again a very important component in this whole process, uh, as uh, we know that India is uh, number two producers in terms of uh, uh, you know the U.S. dollar billion. Uh, 539 uh, billion US dollar total agricultural produce. But in terms of uh, export, when we see uh, we are at rank 11 with only 38 billion US dollar annual export. So that's pretty low. Now, if we have to enhance the farmer's income, double the farmer's income by 2022, as our Honorable Prime Minister has uh, envisaged, uh, the export earning has to also double from 38, 39 billion dollar to almost uh, 60 to 70 billion dollars. And for that, uh, uh, sufficient provisions have to be made. So here, for example, you see our uh, export in the fresh commodity is unprocessed sector is not so bad, particularly in case of meat, fish, and so on. So there is 10%, 17%, and so on. But in case of processed sector, our performance is very poor. And that is where post-harvest storage, processing, and value addition is one important sector where India can strengthen the position in the uh, export by uh, taking uh, this, uh, you know, uh, approach because uh, the share of uh, processed product is very, very low. That needs to be enhanced. And uh, with this, the uh, by 2018, the Prime Minister Modi announced a plan to increase the export to 60 billion dollar by 2022. And uh, all these important commodities, uh, one district, one project, and several other schemes have been identified to address this issue. Overall, finally, the reforms towards secure and sustainable agriculture, enhancing capital investment, incentive link to good agricultural practices, priority for scaling innovation, market reforms, embracing private sector, and good policies, governance. These are uh, extremely important. If I have uh, maybe another two minutes, I will touch on some slides on rice, which is my subject. Uh, in rice, what we are doing, rice uh, has got uh, its lifeline. Rice is life and more so in whole of uh, Asian countries. Uh, in India, rice is annually produced 114 million tons of milled rice, 170 million tons of paddy, and 425 million tons of residue. Feeds 0.8 billion people, 65% of population grown on 67 million farm families. And it's a livelihood security to 150 million rural people. Yearly, he uses 6.5 million tons of fertilizer, harvested from 44 million hectare area, which is 22% of the crop area. So the annual value is 53 billion US dollar of the total crop. It yearly receives 200 uh, cubic kilometer of water, which is 29% of the total water use, and emits 3.5 million tons of methane, 18% of the total agriculture emission. Here, I must say that earlier, these predictions uh, 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 were made by IPCC and other international agencies that India paddy 
fuel emits 37 million tons of methane. And when IRI conducted countrywide experiments and generated the data, it was the estimation was brought to 3.5 million tons only. So query rise from India was not the major uh, culprit, which has been globally uh, accepted. Now the major uh, challenges uh, are more from less with more far more. And when I say uh, more from less in terms of natural resources, including land, water, and everything, with more in terms of nutrition, far more the number of people. Uh, the current uh, productivity, we need to reduce the priority area by 8 million hectare. From 44 million hectare, we have to bring it down to sustain natural resources. And that means we have to increase productivity to five tons per hectare from the current level of 3.5 million tons. This would call for traits like early ceiling vigor, heat tolerance, nematode resistance, disease resistance, weed competitiveness, drought tolerance, iron zinc deficiency tolerance, anaerobic germination, high yields, excellent quality, nutritionally rich rice, and resource efficient variety. So these are the future uh, rice varieties. In addition to that, the diseases like bacterial blight, blast, seed blight, bacterial grain rot, bacane, false smut, brown spot, and so on. There are a number of uh, these biotic stresses which suffer, and that's where we are intensifying our resource through molecular breeding, genomic assisted selection. Uh, 15 varieties that was mentioned in my CV have been developed with combined resistance to blast and bacterial blight. This is one of the variety Pusabak, the 1637, which has got resistance to uh, blast disease. And this was a major challenge for us because the European Union said that if the tricyclazole, a fungicide used to control blast, its residue, if it is 0 0.01 ppm, Mind it, US imports at 3 ppm, Japan imports at 8 ppm, but EU says that if it is 0 0.01 ppm, we will not import basmati from India. And taking the challenge, uh, we have uh, developed varieties combining resistance to uh, blast diseases. One of such varieties uh, has been released and many uh, are there and this is resistance to bacterial blight. That means less pesticide use, no residue, and when pesticide use goes down, the cost of cultivation is reduced and that's another way of enhancing farmers' uh, income. Direct seeded rice is future of rice cultivation. And for DSR, we need traits like uh, herbicide tolerance is one of the most important traits for breeding varieties of herbicide tolerance because weeds are the major culprit for uh, productivity loss. Uh, and then in addition to that, uh, drought tolerance, lodging resistance, zinc, bocane, blast, Root nat nematode is another problem in direct seeded rice, then drought tolerance, anaerobic germination. Uh, we have come out with rice varieties which have got herbicide tolerance and these mutants we developed ourselves through mutagenesis process of ALS gene, acetolactate synthase gene. And the mutant version you can see here, the original variety 1509 is killed on spraying this uh, herbicide imidazolid. But the improved version of 1509 basmati variety where we have transferred the mutant allele of ALS is completely resistant. So this would provide a means for cultivation of, uh, you know, uh, direct seeded rice uh, with no weed uh, loss. Also enhancing the breeding efficiency, breed precise, fast and efficient is important. And that's where the area in which Rajiv is working, he is going to make his presentation. And we have very active collaboration with Rajiv in chickpea and pigeon pea and lentil and several other crops uh, in developing uh, genomic resources and their utilization in breeding program. The development of value chain and this one example, I'm trying to say that from research development of varieties, combining biotic, abiotic, it's just excellent quality. And then their seed production, office scaling and farmer's field coming to Monday. Number of brands, one of our variety, Pusa Vasmati 1121 is sold globally in 80 different brands in Australia. You can find Pusa Vasmati 1121, Dawat, India Gate, 80 different brands in which this variety is sold. And the annual foreign exchange earning by this variety is uh, close to 5 billion US dollar. From single variety, 5 billion US dollar forex earning comes from Basmati rice export. That's a huge uh, uh, contribution for sustaining the, you know, uh, for cutting down the import bill because there are few commodities where we are having edge in terms of export and we are trying to strengthen this further, uh, taking it up by using all uh, innovation. Uh, so with this uh, uh, glimpse of uh, uh, what we are doing, how the future of Indian agriculture looks like, what are the policy reforms, I would once again like to thank each one of you for giving me this opportunity to share uh, the experience uh, at IRI and at, uh, in India with Indian Council of Agriculture Research. Thank you very much. Thanks.
Thank, Thank you. you very much, Dr. Singh. It's a very interesting presentation. I can already see that there are questions for you. Uh, but what we might do is hold off all the questions till all the panelists have um, had a chance to speak. Um, but um, so the next speaker is Professor Rajiv Vashni. And Professor Vashni will talk about accelerating genetic gains in legume crops. Um, Professor Rajiv Vashni is the director of um, director of the research program in genetic grains at ICRISAT. Uh, he is a renowned agricultural scientist who specializes in genomics, genetics, molecular breeding, seed system, and capacity building in developing countries. And he is um, engaged in developing and de delivering innovative R&D solutions to tackle wicked problems facing global agriculture. Uh, Professor Vashni, please um, share your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Anu Ramohan. And uh, I'm grateful to you and Professor Kadambo Siddiq for giving me this opportunity. It's great to see and hear Consul General Madam uh, Mrs. Charandasi. And also great to hear Dr. A.K. Singh, who is a very well-renowned research and role model and mentor for many of us here in India and around the world. And uh, yeah, so good day in Australia and namaste here in India. And I'm great, glad to see several colleagues and friends in this webinar. I could see the names of several good friends, including Dave Edwards, Wallace Cowling, Neil Turner, Shiv Agrawal, Bob Redden, and many other friends. So thank you very much for joining. Professor A.K. Singh gave very nice introduction about the Indian agriculture and they also highlighted that uh, example of uh, basically rice. So here I will talk more little bit research and that how, because we are having this meeting called India Australia week. So basically in this presentation, I would like to highlight how the institutes from that these two different countries, they can work together and then contribute to enhance agriculture productivity. Here you can see these are the two great countries, India and Australia. And if you see in terms of the crops, then there are several important crops for both countries important, including wheat, mustard, chickpea, cotton, and sugarcane. And in the both of these countries, drought and salinity, they are the serious problem for almost all the crops. And then you have the crop related diseases. In this presentation, I will talk about chickpea. You can see here that in India, we are having about 11 million hectare area under chickpea production and about 1 million hectare for the, uh, in Australia. In terms of the crop productivity, India and Australia, they, both of them, they are not doing well. I think we need to enhance this productivity. And in the current time, we are talking about the genetic gain. And if we need to enhance the genetic gain, we need to enhance the selection intensity. We need to enhance the selection accuracy and also need to work towards enhancing the genetic variance in the crop breeding program and also needs to reduce the years per cycle. And I think we have been working together with several Australian organization and the organization from around the world to do something in this direction. So what I will do that I will give some example. And in this context, I would like to mention that we have been very successful to have several collaborative projects with Australia, including with this one AISRF1. And we had several partners, including UWA, University of Adelaide, ACPFG, University of Queensland, RMIT University, University of Melbourne, and Indian Institute, including IRI, NIPGR, etc. The same thing, we had the second project where we had the focus more on the drought and salinity and escocyta blight, again with several Australian partners. And now we are having this third project where we are working with the University of Western Australia, IARI and JNU. So ICRISAT has really very long, track, successful track record to contribute or to collaborate with Australian universities, institutes and contribute in this direction. There are several pictures from our collaborators and those of you who know Professor Kadambo Siddiq, then he is the picture young Kadambo Siddiq, and you can see in many other areas, including Professor Tim Colmer, who is to be our collaborator. Now he's the Deputy Vice Chancellor of, at University of Western Australia. So again, we are very excited to have this collaboration. During this part of these collaboration and other projects from other institute around the world, I think we have been successful to develop chickpea genome published in 2013. Now we have improved this genome by using the high c assembly we also sequenced the about 429 
from all over that uh, different countries in chickpea and now we have completed the sequencing of more than 3000 exosomes so we moved from the one draft genome to more than 3000 genome as a part of the collaboration we established different kind of genotyping platform starting from the ssr now we are having these mid density low density high density snp arrays and not only that one at ikri said we have fantastic platform for the phenotyping of drought tolerance in glass house in rain out shelter lazy skin and field and i will discuss that how we have been using these resources to address some of the issues like drought tolerance now in the case of chickpea as i mentioned so now for instance we are having substantial decrease in chickpea growing area because of this drought what we need to do we need to develop these drought tolerant varieties so that we can have higher yield and we can have deliver more income to the farmers as professor singh mentioned in his presentation that in india they are always talking about providing more income not just only the crop productivity but enhancing the income in the case of chickpea like many other crops roots play a very important role and what we did that by using two real population we did the genetic mapping few years back and then we identified a genomic region in the two different mapping population we call it qtl hotspot this contributes qtls for more than 12 traits and what we did that we started to introgress this qtl hotspot in leading varieties in india and around the world and we have been successful to develop several introgression lines from this QTL hotspot introgression. In the case of India, several lines have been, they showed really high yield over the recurrent parent. And we are very happy to mention that IARI, the Institute of Professor Singh, and my colleague, Dr. Bhardwaj, has been successful to develop and release this variety called Pusa Chickpea 10216 through this molecular breeding efforts. Similarly, in the case of Ethiopia, new variety called Jelly 2 was released, which is having more than 22% higher yield over the traditional varieties, similar kind of pipeline we have in Kenya and Tanzania. So these are the success stories of working together and to contribute to translate the genomic information in the breeding program. We have been also working that what kind of phenotyping traits are being influenced and our data indicate that in fact, by introducing the QTL hotspot, we enhance the plant vigor, which facilitate lower leaf temperature and increase in 100 seed weight formation. That's the way that this drought tolerance is working in the case of chickpea, at least in our experiments. And as I mentioned, we had several collaborators from Australia, from India. This is that example from Nitin Mantri when he was with RMIT. And then uh, he and together with other colleagues, they also did the comparative transcriptome analysis for identification of the genes for drought tolerance. So in the case of drought and further, we wanted to understand the function of the genes. So here at ICRI said as a part of these projects, we did the fine mapping. As a part of this fine mapping, we identified some candidate genes, in fact, five genes. And then we did some analysis based on the 3000 chickpea genome sequencing data. And eventually we thought that, well, these five genes, they may play some important role. And now what we are doing that we are doing the ecotopic expression of the genes in Medicago. And some of these pre, uh, preliminary data, it provided very good evidences about two genes. And this is one is QH gene two, which is also localized to the nucleus of the root cells in Medicago hairy roots and also the QH gene 2 and in the case of Medicago by doing this over expression we identified we we observed higher increase in the root weight and total weight of the plants which is translating in the higher yield so we got some leads now in this direction we need to work further in the case of chickpea so this was drought very quickly that how we were successful to identify the QTS the genes and translate this information to develop the better variety now the other area is salinity tolerance here again in Australia, our colleagues and UWA, they had this very fantastic mapping population at ACPFG, our colleagues from University of Adelaide and SRD, they did this phenotypic, uh, basically phenotypic evaluation on these uh, population, which we also provided about 300 lines from India, and they identified several interesting lines. Similarly, our colleagues here in IRI and also in Soil Salinity Research Institute in Karnal, we did this is salinity tolerance analysis here in Indian germplasm and also in the Australian germplasm. Eventually, we screened about 50 genotypes and we already identified some really good genotypes. Now, these are the good genotypes for use for using them in the breeding program for developing varieties for the salinity tolerance. And furthermore, we had this one population from uh, Australia, another population from IIPR Kanpur. And what we did that we evaluated these population for salinity tolerance in the field conditions as well as in the greenhouse conditions. And by using these data and also the genotyping data with axiom arrays, 
We identified several QTLs explaining up to 28.4% phenotypic variation. So this was really good story. And as I said earlier, so some laboratory like NIPGR and RMIT and uh, ICRI said we also did sometimes back some gene expression analysis for drought and salinity together and try to see the cross talking of these genes. Now, finally, we would like to mention very briefly about Escocyta blight. Although in India is not a C, well, we have a problem, but in the Punjab region, Escocyta blight is a concern, but in Australia, this is a serious concern. So in Australia, our colleagues, they screened this material coming from Ikada, from Ikrisat, and also wild sizer material at SRD in the group of Tim Sutton. And they already identified several interesting lines, which are the Escocyta resistance. And based on these things, they have done the analysis on the different kind of pots experiment, field experiments, and now we are in process of basically identifying the genes by using the GWAS analysis. Here you can see that by using these different things, we can identify some interesting genes which may be associated with Escocyta blight resistance. So this was something that I wanted to mention that how the institutes from India and Australia, they work together with different institutes and we have contributed to understanding the genetics, molecular mechanism, physiology, and translate them in the breeding program and also developed several improved lines and they are reaching now to the farmers in coming time or so. So in summary, I think that's genome germplasm, phenotyping and data science, they're the basic ingredients for plant breeding in 21st century and we can work together on these aspects. Translational genomics has come of the age, even in so-called orphan crops like chickpea. And I would like to highlight once again that collaboration is a key for both generating academic outputs and translating them in agriculture and also important for capacity building. Here in this presentation, I demonstrated as an example in the case of chickpea by talking drought, salinity and escocyta blight. And once again, UW has been a great collaborator and our center works with large number of partners around the world. If you can see the slide in the Australian component, then we have these partners, UWS, RD, Melbourne, CSIRO, CAFI, University of Queensland, ACIR, RMIT, etc. And also University of Sydney and many other institutes from Australia. And of course, all different places of the world. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I will be very happy to participate in those panel discussion on the question and answer session. Thank you very much, Professor, Ramu, uh, Professor Anu. And back to you, please. Thank you very much, Professor Vashni. And um, now I'd like to invite um, Hackett Professor Siddiq, uh, who is the Director of the Institute of Agriculture at the University of Western Australia. Uh, Professor Siddiq, of course, needs no introduction. He has more than 30 years of agriculture research, research training and management experience in Australia. Uh, he's a reputed um, scholar in national and um, international aspects of agriculture and including crop physiology, production agronomy, farming systems, genetic resources, and breeding. And his focus is on wheat, grain, legumes, and oilseed crops. Professor Siddiq, please talk about excellence in research collaboration and education, collaboration between the University of Western Australia and India. Thank you very much. Okay, good. <laughs> Yeah. So, so those who haven't been to the University of Western Australia, this is the campus where we are, and it's a beautiful campus. So please do come uh, to Perth, and uh, and it's a, it's a comprehensive university. Uh, we have an internationally recognised uh, reputation, first in Western Australia, and uh, according to the ranking, and top 100 university. More importantly, well-established industry partnership and is a member of the group eight universities. Those who are not familiar, there are 40 universities uh, in Australia. The group eight does the 70% of the research uh, in Australia in all kinds of research, not just agriculture alone. Uh, you know that we got the Nobel Prize in Medicine in uh, 19, uh, 2005. Uh, Barry Marshall is still a professor here and he do, he do lead the Marshall Infectious uh, Disease Research Center. A great friend of uh, mine, we do travel together. One of my uh, ambitions is to bring him one day to India, uh, New Delhi, and a couple of other places. 
the academic ranking of World University. This is based on metrics. Uh, you can see that we are currently ranked 85 in the world for a small university sitting uh, far away from uh, many parts of the world. It is a great achievement. In agriculture science, we are currently ranked 17th in the world and number one in Australia. This is again a significant achievement. Substantial part of that uh, ranking is because of our international collaboration. For example, if you take um, uh, agriculture science, about 62 percentage of our papers published uh, in Web of Science uh, index journals are from collaboration between more than one institution. A lot of that is with the uh, international partners. So the take home message is that, uh, yes, we do uh, contribute uh, to internationally, but you must collaborate. Going to Australia, we have a wide range of climate uh, from tropical, uh, equatorial, tropical, subtropical, desert, large part of Australia is desert, grassland and temperate. Many parts are uh, very similar to Indian environment and hence uh, the research we undertake uh, here in Australia and India has got application each other. But the most important part is uh, it's the dry lands. The dry lands represents uh, uh, hyper-arid, arid, semi-arid and dry humid. And it is the home of about uh, 2.5 billion people and 41 percentage of the global terrestrial area is dry land. You can see that uh, large part of Australia and large part of India are dry lands. And this is where going to be the next uh, uh, biggest issue, both in Australia or even current issue in terms of climate change and dry land agricultural production system. So what is the current challenges Australian agriculture facing? I won't go into the detail. The number one is climate variability and we need to have resilience for that. Changing consumer preference is happening both in Australia and our international market in terms of, you know, in, in India, GMO is not allowed. And in Australia, some crops are allowed uh, and animal production system is affected and so on. Workforce capacity, we have aging farmers both in India and Australia. And also we need to look at the next generation of uh, researchers both in India and Australia. Environmental and landscape sustainability is a major issue in India. We heard from uh, Professor Singh and the similar situation uh, uh, exists in Australia. Biosecurity, the ins insurgence of new pest and diseases uh, happening. We heard that uh, things are really very much the polar army worm and new pest and diseases are emerging to climate change. Industry disruption, look at the COVID-19. What has it done to world food production, food distribution and so on? India is affected, so as Australia is affected. The cost of production is another big aspect uh, which needs to be looked into it. I think Dr. Singh mentioned about that, how to reduce the cost of production. So the projected climate, uh, climate variables and change is uh, 2030 related to 1990. It's getting hotter. Uh, it's getting rainfall is declining in most parts of Australia, except in the north, and the evaporation is increasing. And climate change is a big issue for India as well. For example, the southwest of Western Australia, the corner I'm showing here, uh, you can see very clear, significant drop in rainfall in southwest of Western Australia since the mid 1970s. And we are not seeing many wet years, we are seeing very, very dry years. And the monsoon is also affected in India. It's not only the rainfall, you can see the temperature has been increasing. If you take zero, no change, you can see since 1975, we are seeing uh, very hot days which is affecting our agricultural uh, production system. So if you look at Australian industry output volatility from 75 to 2016, what is the most volatile uh, enterprise? It is agriculture. So it's an index of about three, whereas if you have a home, your own home, it is the least. I think in India, I can say agriculture is the most volatile uh, enterprise. Farmers cry, uh, problems happening uh, because of the drought and many other conditions. Uh, uh, in both countries. So now with that background, why we should we collaborate? As I mentioned earlier, 98 percentage of the science and technology uh, research done elsewhere, not in Australia. Australia, with a population of 26 million people, we only uh, publish, for example, two to three percent of the global uh, scientific papers. So for a country like Australia, we must collaborate. Does the collaboration lead to 
raising the level of our science and technology? I think yes, the short answer is yes. So if someone who doesn't collaborate, they're not going to make a big impact, particularly in the big uh, ticket items such as climate change, water, genomics, and big data, and so on. The quality of your output, uh, I think there is clear indication that the quality is also improves when you have different brains coming together. We can also say that impact in terms of community benefits. If you do something really good, it can capture various parts of the world, whether it is the food security, nutritional security, and so on in this case. So let us look at India's research output in global settings uh, from Web of Science, uh, the data which is uh, 2008 to uh, as of uh, last week. So India is ranked 10th among the nations in terms of research productivity, judged by the number of uh, Web of Science in this articles and reviews in insights for that period. Australia is 11th, you remember, Australia is a small country compared with India and the budget spent on research, higher education, India is enormous. The other point I want to emphasize, compared to European countries, as well as Canada, Australia, India has a very low rate of international collaboration. That's around 22%. That's not good enough. We have to lift the game for that. And if you look at the um, India's international collaboration 2008 to 20, Australia is ranked eighth. This is really good because uh, in Australia, India always uh, collaborate with the United States, United Kingdom, um, and, and Germany, and Korea more recently, and China, and so on. But Australia is coming eighth. But if you look at the last uh, two years of data, 2018, in fact, 2017 to 2020, Australia moves up to seventh among countries collaborating with India. This is not an accident. I think the governments, both governments, are very keen. We have spent a considerable amount of time with the prime ministers, both in Australia and also in India, in terms of building up that collaboration. So this indicates a growing level of collaboration between researchers, institutions, and the government of two countries. But when you do the collaboration, a lot of people say, where to start? I think the complementarities and strength needs to be identified. You can do that at a higher level, the vice chancellors or, uh, or directors, etc. But we must also uh, make sure that both parties are equal partners. Mutual respect is important. Uh, and that's a recipe for success. And then the details of collaboration can be worked out, not by, my, by the vice chancellors or the managers, but that has to really come from the champions. I call champions. The researchers need to be ones primarily responsible and involved. Rajiv elaborated some example. There's a photo uh, here shows uh, the vice chancellor, then vice chancellor with uh, Dr. Mahapatra on the top there. And on the bottom, we are really in the field with the, one of the Australia India strategic research funded projects. And one of the other issues that we need to develop, we need to spend time in developing the plan. We need to argue each other. We need to clearly document what lies ahead. And we must be also flexible. I mean, almost every day I have arguments with Rajiv on things. And later on, Rajiv say, yes, this time I agree with you. And other time I say, Rajiv, you, I agree with you, you are right. So that sort of mutual agreement uh, and, and that is required. Budgets is very important. When you have a common budget, what money has to go to India or vice versa, Open and transparency is very important. And the most importantly, regular consultation. When we started about 20 years ago, it was more difficult because faxes and so on. Now with the emails and Zoom, it is much more easier. No one can say we can't communicate. Yes, we must communicate. If you look at uh, the successful project, the supervision of students uh, and other young researchers is important, both, both ways. And we must always look for opportunity uh, in each other's laboratory, not always uh, coming to India, going to India, or vice versa. We have strength at both locations. Uh, reports are important. Joint meeting of research leaders. In fact, uh, one of the projects we are now working, we could not meet, but we had to really rely on, rely on uh, the Zoom-based meeting. But uh, the physical meeting and site visits are very important. I don't want to uh, give low emphasis on capacity building must be very important. By all means, get some of the young researchers into the project so they will become the champions for the future. And so this is 
this is important in, in collaboration. Joint research outputs, when you look back after a couple of years, what did we do? Have we achieved? I think one way of showing is uh, publications, the other way is uh, the varieties uh, developed, the other one is training young generation people into that. And we must also look at uh, not just about scientific development opportunities such as translating that work into action as uh, Rajiv and uh, Dr. Singh has mentioned. Remember when we do all the things we forget and then the final report, particularly the funding body, whether it is the DDT in India or the Australian uh, ARC or whatever funding body, we must do that because the funding bodies remember next time when you go, you haven't put a final report. Now, the most common Indian institutions collaborating with the UWA, University of Western Australia, limited to agriculture and plant science as of last week, 2008 to 2020. You can see that ICRISAND stands out. I think I, will, I just got about 120 uh, publications. That's uh, more, some, some may be missing. We started uh, 2008, 2009, I took a visit. And from there, we really built up. And of course, uh, uh, Dr. Singh, see that Indian Council of Agriculture Research that includes ICR uh, and many other uh, research institutions. And that's not behind. We are now really ramping up that, uh, that's sitting around 77. Punjab Agriculture University, our long-term partner, uh, and, uh, and they are, they're doing well, although it goes up and down depending upon the project. More recently, since the AISRF project started, Punjab University under the leadership of uh, 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 Professor Hash Nair is shaping up. And of course, there are a number of other institutions. In this search, I limited to fields with at least uh, 10 collaboration over the last uh, decade. So this is really um, pleasing to me because I've taken a lead role in terms of uh, hap uh, to, the, to this happen between UWA and uh, Indian agricultural research institutions. Rajiv has covered the genomic approaches for stress tolerance. He covered the Indian institutions. And it's not just UWA alone. We were able to bring other institutions, a very uh, notable institution from Eastern Australia in the abiotic stress physiology, pre-breeding and breeding, plant molecular biology, and crop genomics and capabilities. So people may ask the outcome Rajiv has mentioned, the Indian Australian germplasm to drought and heat and salinity, a key physiological and genetic mechanism identified, the molecular markers delivered to breeders for marker assisted selection and genes identified. And Rajiv mentioned the varieties have been released in, in at least in India and Ethiopia. Then selection tool, gene databases, um, next generation of pulse breeders, molecular geneticists and crop physiologists in India and Australia. Uh, the, the, the photo down shows uh, uh, Neil Turner and myself in uh, Ludhiana uh, looking at some of the chickpea plots there. And Rajiv has already covered that uh, it's just not about uh, the, uh, the papers and the collaboration and, and turning that into, uh, into, into varieties. For example, Dr. Bharadwaj from Indian Agricultural Research Institute is a practical breeder with a lot of energy and enthusiasm. Another project we started uh, in India, this is uh, in uh, the India and Indonesia on looking at uh, the food security and governance of local knowledge in India and Indonesia. And we were looking at uh, regulatory structures, policies, and conservation of uh, genetic resources. Uh, again, Kerala Agriculture University, uh, GB Pandi University, Uttarakhand, and with other universities uh, in Indonesia and in Australia. And we went and looked at the three districts, the Wayanad, uh, the Palkut, and the Malapuram districts, and looked at the traditional rice varieties. And we turned that into a, a publication which just came out in with Springer, Local Knowledge, Intellectual Property, and Agriculture Innovation, with a number of uh, chapters coming from both from India and Australia and Indonesia. I mean, there are a no, lot of papers published. I won't go into the details, but you can just uh, see the amount of uh, papers in good journals published over the years uh, with the real uh, application in, in agriculture uh, and so on. So this is the one which Rajiv mentioned that we are working on another one at the moment. And in general, Australia has benefited uh, not necessarily directly from that particular projects, but a number of varieties released in Australia are either based on 
Indian germplasm or from materials obtained from Ikara, in this case, uh, legumes. The, the functional genomics on chickpea uh, enhanced drought tolerance, Rajiv has already mentioned. Again, Dr. Singh, huge collaboration with Indian Agricultural Research Institute. I personally would like to strengthen that because I did my master's from IRI, so I always have an attachment to that institute. We can only go further. And we did bring a number of PhD students. For example, Ruchi Bensal from National Bureau of Plant Genetic Resource came here as a as an Endeavor Fellow, Dr. Rajendra Karla from uh, Ludhiana Punjab Agriculture University came. Uh, Vijay Punia from IRI Agronomy Division came here for six months. Renu came here as an Endeavor Fellow to do PhD. Then Mukesh Choudhury from ICR Maze Research Institute in Ludhiana is currently with us here. Uh, Amir Khan just finished his PhD with, uh, between, between ICRISAT and uh, UWA, just finished and submitted. Sneha Reddy from IRI is just uh, coming, waiting for the border to open, and Agai Pratap. So the list goes on. These are the great investment we can do together. And the University of Western Australia is highly committed to India. And our strategy for India is going to go up in the current leadership. And it's a matter of now uh, the COVID situation improves. We will be coming. We will be collaborating more with India. Again, some of those people come for six months. Vijay Punia, Punia, Punia turned that into a paper in plant and soil, Ruchi's work uh, uh, with uh, us into uh, plant cell environment, again, new phytology papers. So these young researchers, when they go back, they feel they get the culture of uh, science, they get a different culture of working in a different lab, and they go back into their, into their domain, and they should be able to then replicate or at least to start uh, thinking and establishing a link with us. Group eight, 8 universities has produced a two-way mobility of PhD students between India and Australia. If people haven't seen that, I recommend it. We worked very hard. What are the key elements of a successful joint PhD program between India and Australia? And that's articulated well there. And we heard from uh, Dr. Singh that the government of India is going to give huge emphasis on digital technology, harnessing the, harnessing the digital revolution for Australian farmers and land managers is a big thing happening in Australia, a real world use cases. So there is a potential for India and Australia to uh, collaborate, particularly IT side. India is, uh, has, is an enormous leader in the world and there are a lot of engineers and computer scientists in India who could do things faster than anywhere else in the world. So my last slide, Anu, what is the elements of success? The elements of success is leadership from both sides. We need champions in India, champions in Australia, whatever we want to do. The passion and commitment. Without that, nothing happens. Focus, India is a large country with lots of states and so on. If you don't focus, you could get lost. Trust, make sure that we have trust each other, mutual respect, and reality checks. Occasionally reflect back and say, are we doing the right thing? Do we need to change our plan of action? And of course, uh, communication, communication, and again, communication. I also want to tell you that uh, we are in the process of signing a joint Australia-India Water Research Center with five, six universities from Australia and five, six uh, universities, institutions from India, including IITs. That will be signed on, I think, 7th of uh, November, uh, and that will be a big, big move because the Prime Minister Modi, when he came to India, he said, into Australia, he said that uh, the water is a critical thing, so as uh, water is a critical thing for Australia. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Siddiq. That's a very interesting um, presentation. Um, we have a few questions here. Maybe I'll just, um, if any, participants have any questions they can ask, um, they can put it in the chat and I'll just read them out um, to the um, speakers. I see Rajiv that you have answered a couple of these questions. So let me start by putting a question from Alphonse. Um, he wants to know what are the legislative measures in India that erode the cultivable lands to building development? 
I, I, is, yeah. Dr. Singh can say. Yeah. So can you repeat that question again? Yeah, so the question is, what are the legislative measures taken in India that erode the cultivable lands and give them yeah, to building development? This, yeah. Yeah. this has been a major uh, challenge, as a matter of fact, because of the uh, cultivable land going into construction. The recent norms with the government submitted uh, uh, you know, mandatory that no constructions Horizontal constructions are not allowed. Multi-story constructions only allowed now, so that you have maximum utilization of vertical uh, spaces, green buildings. So uh, the details of legislative norms is uh, exactly I can get back uh, later. But yes, this is a major concern because of the construction, the area under cultivation is declining, which is a challenge. And uh, considering that the vertical building is a norm now. Most residential areas, every place it is vertical building and also educational institutions. Even places like IRI where we have a lot of land, but no uh, horizontal construction is allowed. Okay. Thank, thank you, Dr. Singh. Um, so the next question is from Kanak, and this could be answered by either um, Rajiv or Professor Siddiq. So in the present context, what is the pro promising procedure that could be followed to develop an idiotype of chickpea? Rajiv can start first and then I'll... Hmm. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Very good question. And I think these kind of approaches have been used in several cereal crops, including rice. So now, depending on the pulse crop that which we are talking, so we already know that what kind of food traits you need but uh, so one can do that one but now this recent approach what we are doing and this is one step ahead than idiotype so now based on the germ plasm sequencing we can mine the different kind of haplotypes for the different genes second based on the phenotyping data we can even identify that out of these haplotypes which are superior haplotypes and once you have these kind of catalogs we can basically reconstitute a genotype and we can know that we need this particular haplotype for flowering time, this particular haplotype for the seed size, this particular haplotype for the drought tolerance. So now we can create a, a basically genotype based on the haplotypes and based on this information, we can bring those different kind of haplotypes in elite varieties or reconstitute the new new genotype which will be having basically all possible superior haplotypes. So that will be my proposal at this stage. Thank you. Well, I just uh, add a bit into that. First of all, you need to define your environment. So you cannot have a universe, universal idiotype uh, uh, for, for any crop. So if you define your environment, the constraints, the soil type, the water balance, uh, the, the type of uh, growing season, then you define whether it is a short duration, limited branching type, or uh, more determinate type, all depends upon the environment. So first to define the environment, then look at uh, what is the phenology, what is the phenotype and genotype you re require, then bring what Rajiv has mentioned about uh, the approach, whether it is the breeding approach or it is the agronomic approach uh, to manipulate that uh, idiotype. Thank you, thank you. Um, so the next question is from Dr. Jyoti Kiran Shukla. And her question is about feminization of agriculture is a growing trend. Um, I think this may be for Dr. Singh. Yet women stay invisible as farmers and cultivators and do not get the benefits of technological advancements and financial gains. What are your views, Professor Singh, on this in the context of the new agriculture reforms? Yeah. And it's a very important question again. Uh, and considering the importance of women in agriculture, you know, the Indian Council of Agriculture Research has opened a full fledged institute on uh, National Research Center on women in agriculture. And uh, there is a lot of emphasis uh, in terms of technology development, particularly uh, which could ease uh, avoid the drudgery of, uh, you know, farm laborers, particularly women. For example, if you take the paddy transplanting. It's 100% uh, manual work and mostly done by the women laborers. 
So uh, likewise, many operations, the harvesting, manual harvesting, and so on. The mechanization will certainly uh, take uh, care of many of these diseases that is uh, involved the women working in the field and their participation is facilitated with the help of uh, uh, development of technology which can avoid delivery of their work. That's a major focus in the current policy. And if I may add, uh, there are a number of KV case in India which is uh, specializing in women empowerment. And the other thing, as Dr. Dr. Singh mentioned, the value adding, post-harvest uh, handling, post-harvest value adding, that's where the women uh, empowerment and uh, entrepreneurs can come. Uh, and I think the government of India is uh, not think, is going to give a lot of emphasis on that. Uh, it's not just about going and breaking your back in the field and the partial mechanization, chickpea harvesting technology, the new varieties, et cetera, will help. But I think the most important area is uh, value adding and making an enterprise out of the agricultural products, the village level, and then replicating that at a larger scale and then feeding into the mega cities of India as, as a, a quality food source. For example, in state of Kerala, they have a, a concept called Kudumba Sri. Uh, the ladies unite and then they, uh, they take the enterprise to the next level. There is uh, micro credit facilities and things are available for women and farm. Thank you. Yes. So there are a number of, you know, the women self-help groups yes. have been uh, created and particularly the women self-help groups are meant for, you know, the small scale industries like, you know, pickles making, jam, jelly and these kinds yes. of things with more uh, uh, technical support uh, because earlier uh, the science base was less. It was being done by women. It is not that it was not being done by women in early uh, years. It was being done, but now with more of science based support. And uh, Krishi Vigyan Kendra and the Farm Science Center that was mentioned by Professor Siddiq, uh, this provides intensive uh, training uh, in these areas to women farmers. Uh, Nutri Gardens, for example, is another area where you know we have uh, uh, for each family we provide a model for Nutri Garden farming and then educating women on nutrition because they are the one who will carry forward this message for a nutrition enrichment for the child and for the family. The area which are doing, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so the next question is from Anirban. So he wants to know that in the context of the Atmanirbhar, what are the opportunities for Australian technology owners to commercialize their expertise in India? Horticulture production, dairy production, marine fisheries, or bulk grain management. So. So, I mean, uh, the uh, establishment of, uh, you know, uh, factories and production units and those processes have been quite simplified in the new uh, reforms. So anybody who wants to come and make investment, there is uh, plenty of opportunity and also one can find a mutual partner in India. And with the help of that, see, we have been doing quite a few programs with the other government, Brazilian government, and all where we have invited the entrepreneurs from Brazil. They came here for uh, three months, they stayed, and we uh, provided a one to one link with the entrepreneurs in India in the similar business. And likewise, the entrepreneurs from India have gone to Brazil for uh, three months' time and to understand things and then develop joint project also for funding from the government. So those those are the kinds of opportunities available for the investment. Thank you. Uh, there's a question here, I think, uh, Professor Siddiq. Um, with respect to collaborations, there's a big gap between public and private research institutions. Any thoughts on this? Very excellent point. Yes. Um, so if you look at uh, traditionally, um, we have been collaborating with the uh, the public uh, institutions, that is the government institutions. And uh, nowadays, uh, there's a significant focus on private institutions. For example, uh, University of Western Australia, our university has got uh, uh, excellent collaboration established with uh, Amity University, uh, Vellur Institute of Technology, VIT, and so on. So um, we will see that because uh, uh, the resources uh, are, are pretty good there uh, and also uh, easy to do business, uh, sometimes uh, much easier to get the approval process uh, compared with the other institutions. But then we could look at a model where we could have the 
uh, government institutions plus the private, uh, public-private partnership. That may uh, do a win-win situation. So, yes, we need to look at that, including joint teaching programs and joint research programs. Excellent point. Yep, thank you very much. Um, so another question also, I think this is also for you, Professor Siddiq. Please explain about marketing linkage in Australia for agriculture products. Yes, um, if you look at uh, just uh, uh, Dr. Singh's uh, baby, the rice, uh, we do import a significant amount of rice, uh, particularly basmati rice from India. Currently, uh, if my memory is right, we are importing about 300,000 tons of rice. Australia also produced rice, but uh, that depends upon the rainfall. In a good year, when we have good rainfall in the eastern Australia, we produce a million tons of rice. And that dropped to something like 80,000 tons uh, the last 10 years because of the decadal drought we had. We do import all kinds of uh, uh, food items from India. When I first uh, came to Australia, uh, nearly 40 years now, uh, we could not uh, get any products. Uh, now everything is available. Uh, your snacks and um, sweets and uh, spices and cashews and so, but you have to go through the process of the quarantine procedures. Even pre-cooked food is available. You can just go and get it, then heat it up, samosas and all that. So the business is open uh, and Australia is welcoming Indian um, enterprises to come and establish here. Uh, the Australian High Commission is very, very um, cooperative and we have the Austrade offices uh, in various parts of India. So please contact uh, some of the counterparts in India and find out the details. As soon as the COVID situation improves, we'll have a better trade relationship. Thank you. I think we are running out of time. So I have time for one more question. Um, so this is a question from Vijendra Pal. How is the gene, gene editing is progressing in India? And how is the Indian policy support for GM technology? Rajiv? Well, yeah, I can. Yeah, Dr. Singh. Okay, so uh, the, the regulation on genome edited crops uh, is uh, at a pretty advanced stage. And our stand is very clear that the products of SDN1 and SDN2. The, the two, three approaches actually, SDN1, SDN2, and SDN3. The SDN1 and SDN2 type product should be considered as a normal product of uh, breeding because they don't carry barren protein uh, and uh, genes. And this uh, uh, is uh, almost accepted. The final legislation has to come. As far as SDN3 is concerned, that will be regulated as the transgenes are regulated. That's the current uh, sign. A lot of work is happening on genome editing, particularly for the uh, those uh, genes for which the natural mutants were already available the, with the favorable phenotypes. And we are trying to create that uh, in the uh, most widely cultivated uh, genetic background. So for example, in case of rice, the gene XA13 confers resistance to bacterial blight. Most of varieties that carry susceptible again. So by SDN1 approach, you could convert a mega variety, which is susceptible to bacterial blight into the bacterial system to genome. And this would not get into the regulation. Did you want to add, Raji? No, I think well, Professor Singh mentioned very clearly, so I don't have anything to add. And as he mentioned, like Department of Biotechnology Government of India is in advanced stage. And there are a lot of consultation is going on. Thank you. So I think we are running out of time. It's been a very enjoyable session. I'd like to thank all these panelists for their very informative um, discussions. And there are still many questions coming. But um, please join me in thanking all the uh, participants for their uh, contributions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much thank for this opportunity. Thank you, Anu, for uh, facilitating. Thank nice you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank thank you. Giving us the opportunity. Have a nice day. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you. And Dr. Bye. Singh will catch up. We've got, we got a lot, lot happening between uh, UWA and uh, IRI and so on. IRI, yeah. 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 yeah, particularly on the water project, I, I am aware yeah. of that. So yeah. I think we'll take it forward with more rigor and intensity. Yeah. yeah.
Thank you very much Thank for your you. time. Thank you. Thank so. you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 B